Welcome to the data structures and applications. Uh, last session, we have been talking about a recursion and uh, some of the examples like factorial and uh, other examples which we will try to explore, especially the recursive functions where it becomes doubly recursive. For example, GCD factorial, both are single, uh, you know, kind of uh, recursive functions, but there are some more examples like Fibonacci numbers, towers of Hanoi, these Ackermann function, for instance, these come under the double recursive. So uh, this example again, we just started in the previous session, so we will just uh, quickly recap and then move on to the working of this Fibonacci sequence how we could actually find nth Fibonacci number uh, using recursive tree as we discussed in the previous examples. So the Fibonacci sequence starts from 0 or 1. The first two numbers are normally given as the initial values and uh, the third one for instance is calculated by computing the addition of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. For instance, the third one we have here the. For example, this one is nothing but the addition of the previous two numbers. One plus one is two. Similarly, if you want to calculate the next Fibonacci number, it's the addition of the previous two like two plus one. That is N minus one and N minus two. Similarly, five is nothing but is calculated again the addition of the previous two three and two which is five and so on so this is a series where any nth fibonacci number can be calculated if we know the previous two which are nothing but the fibonacci sequence itself so unless we know the fibonacci sequence of the previous two we cannot calculate the current one hence it can be put in the form of a recursive function like fib of n, you know, if n is 0 or 1, these are two initial values, both return 1, or we can start from 0 and then 1 as well, as we have already discussed. So the other values, that means n is greater than 1, it's nothing but we need uh, to calculate the previous two, that is n minus 1 and n minus 2. Fibonacci of those two. So this is one Fibonacci sequence. This is another. So how do we explain this? Okay, before that we have the algorithm. Same, you know, the translation of the recursive function. So if n is 0, return 1. n is 1, return 1 again. So these are the two initial values. It will not call the recursive function Fib of n anymore. So these are the escape mechanisms. Now when n is greater than 1, as we have given here, then you have to calculate. That means call this Fibonacci function, same function, but this time reducing the value by 1, reducing the value by 2. Now, the problem here is unless we know the values of these two functions, we cannot do this addition. So addition operation can be done only if we have the final value of this left hand side and also the right hand side. So this is a bit tricky in terms of the working of this algorithm. So let's explain this by picking up this example. Assume that we would like to find the Fibonacci sequence. The nth Fibonacci number in this case it is 4. Let's say we need to return what is the fourth Fibonacci number for example 1 1 2 3 5 right so 1 2 3 4 5 fifth one so we need to calculate the previous two that is this one we need to calculate the previous two values so we'll just start with <clears throat> the n value which is fourth one so zero one two three fourth one and uh, 
if n equal to 1, then you can return or 0, you can return. So those are the two escape conditions. For all values n greater than 1, in this case, yes, then call, that means both the function of fib n minus 1, fib n minus 2. So in the expression of n minus 1, so fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. Now what happens? Now what happens? We have only the left hand side n minus 2. So I'll just write it as n minus 2. So what happens here? We call this function. So that is shown on the left hand side. All this second expression, sub expression is shown on the right. Okay, so once the evaluation of this expression comes by picking up the first operand of this addition operation, it calls the recursive function by reducing the value of n by one. So we get three, so four minus one, three. Now, unfortunately, what happens when you go back to the same function fib carrying the value for n as 3, now we get again the same expression, but right hand side cannot be executed because the, assuming that left to right evaluation is done. So first we need to call again this. So this time 2 because 3 minus 1, 2. So it comes like this. Then it comes to this. Now 2 would again call subtracting 1, which is 1. So this is the path again. So from 4, it is n minus 1, n minus 1, n minus 1. Now when n is 1, return 1 because we have the return path. Okay, now what happens? It carries this, the value of this as 1. But the problem is that you have to, it has to complete the job of the second sub expression here because when you return back to this, you have some more work to do in this particular stack frame or in this particular framework. So it has to now pick this value if it's available. Unfortunately, there is no value available, but it's again a recursive call. So what happens? So this time we go with n minus 2. So the current value in this stack frame, n value is 2. So 2 minus 2 is 0. So when you call again the same function, it returns. So it, it doesn't call any more recursive function of fib. So it returns 1. So it comes here and then returns 1. Now this expression can be computed. That is 1 is available for the left and 1 is available for the right and hence we can carry 2 to this. So this will be the value for the left hand side. So when you come here to this particular framework, now n value is 3. Now we have one more work to do here in this particular uh, you know, level, which is nothing but fib of n minus 2. So 3 minus 2 is 1 and hence it returns. So again it returns 1. So now we have the value for left, value for right. So 2 plus 1 is 3. So it goes to 3. So now we have the value of this n minus 1, that is fib of 3. We have returned here. In this level, we have left out with this side, the right hand side. So again, 4 minus 2 is 2, right? So 2 would call again both left as well as right because we don't have values for the left or right, both. So again, the same thing is carried out similar to this fib of 2. So come down here, it is n minus 1 is 1, so return 1. Similarly here, 0, return 1, this is 2, so 2 is available. So after coming here, it carries this 2. And now since you have the values for both left as well as the right, so 3 plus 2 is 5. So we have the... Uh, you know, next number after this 1, 1, 2, 3 is nothing but 5. So after 3, what is the value of the Fibonacci sequence? 
So we can easily see here that it's nothing but the previous two value addition of previous two values 3 and 2, which is 5. So on the left branch indicates that they are for n minus 1 is the left hand side or the right branch indicates for the right and hence unless you get the values of both left as well as the right both the operands addition cannot be performed. So it's almost similar to a simple recursive call and return, but the recursive call is not limited to just one time kind of thing, but twice in the same statement in the addition statement. OK, so now. We will move on to the next uh, very interesting uh, example here for recursion. Uh, people say that uh, Towers of Hanoi problem is best solved using, uh, you know, recursion rather than iterative methodology. OK, we have a bit of history for this uh, Tower of Hanoi. Um, it goes 1500 years ago, so it's a very, very, very old kind of uh, uh, history which we have. Well, so what exactly it means here? Um, the monastery in Banaras, India, there are is actually connected to Indian history. So there are three diamond towers. So these are called as the towers. Uh, we we also call them as pegs. You know, uh, we will name them. Maybe in the next slide we will show uh, the names of each of these pegs. A, B, C kind of thing. Okay. When it comes to algorithm, yes, we have. Uh, uh, some other names like beginning, axillary, end, you know, all that. Okay. Right. So these are the three diamond towers holding 64 discs made up of gold. So there are two items here pegs are the towers and the discs. <coughs> and here you can see here the, the, the discs are not of the same size, but they are of different sizes. That means the bottommost one will be the biggest one. And uh, as you go from bottom to top, the size of these, uh, uh, you know, golden uh, disc will be smaller. You can see this is the smallest one. So this is the smallest one. Right now, there is a constraint in this particular way uh, of storing or, you know, putting these. Uh, in the pegs or the towers. That means we'll assume that each disk has got a hole so that we can uh, drop these disks uh, in the towers. OK, so that means it can slide over these towers. Uh, so the. I mean, we, we have not yet come to the problem statement. I'm just uh, giving you the history first. We have three pegs or towers and we have this. So these are made of diamond. The discs are made of gold and they have to rest normally, not in a haphazard manner, but the largest one at the bottom and the smallest one at the top. OK, so all this, all uh, 64 discs were stacked in the first tower. You can see here all these are put in the first tower only. What is the job of the monk? The monks have to move all these discs, 64 discs from this tower to this one, you know, the last one, using this as an auxiliary or a temporary tower or peg. So now I think you must have, the viewers must get an idea of what exactly we're supposed to do in towers of an eye problem. What is that we are supposed to do? We are supposed to do, given the number of discs, maybe 64 or 3 or 4 or 5. Our job is to transfer all these from this starting or the beginning tower to the end tower, this one, using this as an axillary tower. But at any point of time, you are not supposed to keep a bigger disk over the smaller one. It should follow this constraint even while moving. Right? So we have to move this, all the disks which are there in the first tower to the last one. So that is the major job. But while moving, 
make sure that you don't keep a larger one on the top of the smaller one. Now, how do we do this? How to get the solution for this problem? You can make it uh, more simple because recursion helps us uh, in breaking the problem or bringing down the problem to the lowest possible uh, scenario. For instance, supposing if I have only two disks, you know, I can easily do it by transferring, you know, the smaller one, the topmost one, because you can only remove this topmost one uh, here as an axillary one and you are left with only the bigger one because only two disks. So I can just put this larger one here and then transfer. So the first move is here, the second move is here and the third move you just finish the job. So two disks, it's not a big thing, but moving of the disk from one peg to the other and again repeat the same thing or you know uh, do the job again in a similar way whether you have, uh, you know, n disks or otherwise, you know, whether you have two disks or three disks, any n disks, you are going to do the same process again and again, repeatedly. So that concept helps us in uh, framing the solution for this particular uh, problem so that we can easily solve this uh, by using recursive methodology. But before we go to the algorithm and working of uh, this entire, you know, towers of an eye problem, we will understand the movement in a manual fashion. So that this is going to be the fundamental knowledge which we get. So initially, let's assume that we are given three disks because it's easy to understand. Two is too small. Three is reasonably good so that we will understand the process. So we are given three disks that is n equal to three and we have as we have already explained, you know, we are given three towers or pegs and they are named as A, B, C. So job is to move all these three disks from A to C using B as an axillary tower, right? So how to uh, move this? from A to C. So what we do is we will first move this disk, the smallest one to C. OK, so that is what shown here in the first move. So this is the first one. The numbers indicated uh, here within brackets is the number of moves. So the first move, we simply move the smallest one to C. Now what we can do is move this again to B because we cannot put this larger one over the smaller one. So we can move now from here. Second is from A to B. So that's exactly what it is shown here as a second move. Now what we can do, we cannot move from here to here. Right? There's no point in moving this to here because we need to somehow make sure that the largest one comes and sits at the C as the bottom most. So what we do is we'll move the smaller one to here, the C to B. So there's a third move. We can see here C to B. Now we have space here. Now we can move from A to C. So we are through with the fourth uh, move. So now this disk, largest one has come here. Now again, since this is empty, we can make use of that. Now I think you would have got the result uh, almost. So we can move this smaller one from B to A. There's a fifth move. You can see here this green one has gone here. Now it's very simple that B to C and then A to C. Done. So now we can easily see that we have moved. Let me just uh, explain this again. So the smallest one from A to C and then from, you know, A to B. That is, you can see here, this the second one to B, and now from C to B, and then A to C, and then now B to A, and now B to C, and then A to C. So it's very simple that we have taken seven uh, moves, three this. So there is a formula which we can derive actually, two power n minus one. 
So in this case, 2 power 3 is 8, minus 1 is 7. So we need 7 moves uh, in order to, you know, transfer all the disks from A to C. That means 3 disks. So similarly, if you have more disks, uh, you know, 2 power n minus 1 can easily be calculated that those many moves are required. OK, so now we need to organize our statements in order to see that how these moves can be uh, done algorithmically or recursively. So what is most important here is the recursive part of it. So we can just now show. OK, now this is the uh, uh, you know move each move which is indicated uh, as I've already explained like uh, A to C, A to B, you know, all that. OK, so the fundamental uh, steps required in order to solve the Towers of Hanoi problem is that we have to have <coughs> label the pegs A, B, C. These labels may move at different steps. Most important one is that we have uh, three pegs, right, A, B, C, but the problem is that the movement, the movement uh, of the disk from one peg to the other, uh, it may change. For example, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'll just take this particular uh, figure. In this case, a, B, C. Originally, we have named A to C. That is starting C is the ending, B is the auxiliary. But you can see here that from fourth to fifth move, we have to move from B to A because we need to get this larger one out so that it can be moved from B to C. So in the process, the actual naming convention of starting and ending and auxiliary keeps changing. So this is the most important point. It's not fixed always because here to start with it's fine, but when it comes to that some pegs are vacant, we are using that as auxiliary or temporary. See, originally we said B is the temporary one and A is starting and C is ending. But now it's not like that. Maybe I am using A as temporary in order to move from B to C. Okay, so now that naming is changed. But this is exactly what we call here as a different steps. The, you know, the labeling of the pegs may differ. I'll come to that when we talk about the recursive tree, how exactly these things will change. Next. Let us assume that n be the total number of disks and how they are uh, numbered starting from top to bottom. OK, so this is one. OK, let me just take a pen here. So this is one. This is two. This is three. So normally the naming convention is starting one, two, three, top to bottom. So disk one is moved from A to C like that. OK, so this I think will not change. There's no problem. OK, now to move N disk from A to B, right? That is A to C, maybe using B as auxiliary or otherwise. OK, move N minus one disk from A to B, right? And move top disk from A to C and move N minus 1 disk. From. So, this moving of N minus 1 disk, you concentrate uh, uh, thoroughly because uh, that's the most important one for the recursion. So, what does it mean? It means that we need to move, we need to move N minus 1 disk. Supposing if I have 3 disks. Two disks have to be moved. Now, if I have two disks, I need to move one. So that's the process. Similarly, in order to move from B to C, so now A to B, B to C, because B is the auxiliary one. B is the auxiliary. One. 
So I'm using in order to move from A to C you uh, using B as my intermittent one. Uh, but uh, how many disks I do? I need to repeat the process. Whatever I'm using for uh, one disk, I need to keep on doing the same thing until the number of disks become zero. That means no disks are there. So that's exactly what we call it as n minus one disk, similar to factorial. So n into fact of n minus one, that is fact of five, for example, is five into four into three into two into one. So until it becomes one. Similarly, I have three disks. Top two have to be, uh, you know, moved. Similarly, top one like that. OK, so now what happens? The same process have to be done in a similar way because B is auxiliary from B to C. That means my job is done. So in the process of moving the first n minus one, this is the first step, n minus one disk, I may use B as auxiliary, but then from B to C, I may use A as auxiliary. That process I've already explained. That's the problem. So labeling may change in order to transfer or move from A to C doing intermittent one. So A to B and then B to C. OK, so now we can write the algorithm uh, uh, using the previous uh, knowledge. You can see here this is the first N minus one disk moving. And this is the second N minus one moving and this is the actual movement from beginning to end. So what we start with, see, should not get confused <clears throat> because the naming or the labeling of the pegs will change. So let us now uh, clarify this. We have three parameters. This is the beginning. This is the intermittent one and this is the end one. So I call this as beginning, auxiliary and end. So we can just say the values of these variables or parameters are A, B and then C. So whenever you call this function, we send these naming convention or labeling so that the movement will take place from beginning to end. So as long as n is greater than zero, you need to keep on doing this because uh, when n becomes zero, that means no disks are there to move. You don't need to call recursively. OK, so this is similar to the previous recursive functions where this is my escape mechanism. So this is the path to come out of this recursive call. So the first part of this traverse of an eye is to move n minus one this beginning you can see here now there is a change between what these two so the second and the third parameters are interchanged end and axillary and uh, keep doing this and once you finish all n minus one then you can move that disk whatever because when you start with three, three minus one is two, two minus one is one. So you get the first disk. That's the idea. OK, so when you get the first disk, you can move that. From beginning to end, beginning to end. That's the first move. You know, you can see here. Beginning first disk beginning to end A to C. Right. OK, so in which case you can see here these two are interchanged when you call again and again. But when it comes to that, that no more recursive call is required, then we can move the disk from beginning to end. This is very important, beginning and end. Right. Now, once you finish this, then you could move from this intermittent one to the next one, in which case you can see here the first two will be interchanged. Axillary will come here, beginning will you can see here. Here, end and axillary, that is this one. Right? In either case, when you try to print the movement of the disk in that particular uh, level, 
of the recursive tree, you will see that it is from beginning to end. Right? OK, so the first recursive call is for moving from uh, A to B and then from B to C. So B acting as the axillary one. And uh, whenever you invoke this function, recursive function, first function concentrates on interchanging of the two parameters, second and the third. And uh, next one is the first two parameters. You can see here beginning and axillary are interchanged. OK, anyway, I will use this algorithm also in the next slide in order to explain how exactly it works because everything should be synchronized with the way in which the disks are moved and which disk can flow from which peg to which peg, etc. All these things can be understood now with one slide, which is my this slide. Yeah. Now this is a bit uh, lengthy one, so you have to, you know, yeah. We need to go through in a sequence. So follow my instructions very carefully because I'm quite sure that you will not get this explanation anywhere else. So I have my algorithm here. So initially ABC for beginning, axillary and end. <coughs> and uh, I have my Okay, I'll just pick green color. Okay, so I have my uh, recursive calls, you know, uh, for the first recursive call with uh, n minus one again, with labeling changed, second one. So you can see here in the tree, just like Fibonacci, the left branches, left branches all correspond to the first recursive call, the right branches for the second recursive call in between you have the print so you have the red uh, uh, colored moments you can see here a to c a to b you know all these are the print statements okay now again do remember that whenever you make a call to the same then i mean when you come back after completing so many recursive calls you should come back and execute this and also this. So the return address is here. OK, do remember. Supposing I assume that n value is 3, right? n value is 3 here. Now you come here for the first time. Now it calls again the same function. But don't forget that with that n value 3, you need to execute this statement when you back. That's very, very important. At that point of time, what are the values of beginning, axillary and end? Start with the values of beginning, axillary end are nothing but A, B, C. So this is the starting call from the main. So from the main, this is sent with N equal to 3 labeling as A, B, C. Now, it comes here, n is greater than 0, <clears throat> and hence it enters into this if statement block where it calls again. So what is uh, the value being sent? You can see here n is 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, this one, and beginning and, <coughs> sorry, axillary and end the last two parameters have to be integer C and B. You can see here that's done. OK, now remember for this recursive call, again it has to execute this. For n equal to 3, it has to execute this. For n equal to 2 also, there's a pending return addresses, you know, pending print statements. So since now 2 minus 1, it is 1. So towers of ni, again it goes here. N is greater than 0 because N is 1. It again comes here and you know it calls, but this time it is 0. So now 
it won't call any more the recursive function. So starting with 3, n minus 1 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. By carrying this when it is 0, okay, 1 minus 1, 0, no more recursive calls are done. So when n equal to 1, <coughs> That means this level that this particular path it has to come back and then print because this is the a statement which it has to execute because it cannot go directly here. So it has to execute this. So what is the statement? Move disk one. So what is n here? One. Okay. So move disk one. Right. Move disk one. Uh, from beginning to end. So what is the beginning and end? A and C. Remember this beginning and end is A and C. So it prints A to C. That's exactly what we have, you know, this smaller disk that is 1, 2, 3. So this one now goes here, A to C. Right. Now after completing this print statement, it has to now execute, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, after executing this, it has to return back. It has to return back. Now, when it returns back, now n value is 2 and it has to complete this job again, right? It has to complete this job. So, what is the value of n? It is 2 and beginning and end is a and b. So to execute disk 2 is obvious, disk 2 A to B. So now 1 has already gone here, now 2 from A to B. So 2 will come and sit here. So now I'll just show that this is gone, this is gone. So this is 1, right? And 2 will come here. So this is also gone. Okay, now, so this is 2, right, so it has finished that and when this calls again, because n value is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1 and this time you can see here that auxiliary and beginning has to be interchanged, the first two has to be interchanged. That's why you can see here C and A. B remains same, C and A. Because N value is 2 minus 1, 1, it again enters into this recursive path and now it enters into this, the first one. So A becomes 1 and C, A, B. Now this is beginning, this is end. So no more recursive call because 1 minus 1, similar to the this one. So 1 minus 1, 0. So now it has to print the remaining 1. Our remaining statement is beginning to end, which is C to B. So now C to B is this. So this is gone and this will rest here. Okay, now three moves are over. Now, no more recursive calls. So it comes back here. Now it's already finished the execution of this. Now it again goes back here. When n equal to 3, it has to execute this, remember. So what is beginning to n? A to C. So that is printed here. So A to C is nothing but this to this. Now your space, the bigger one, that is n equal to 3, the third is bigger one will be available here. A to C. Now, 3, again it will invoke n equal to 2 with the last two interchange, C and uh, beginning auxiliary A to B and uh, yeah, first two that is beginning and auxiliary uh, will be interchanged uh, similar to this. So the right side, no, right side is this one, sorry. So right side is the first two that is A and B are interchanged because right children or right uh, branches will be the first two. Uh, left side will be the last two, so you can remember that. So B and A are interchanged and since N value is still not uh, 
zero uh, is greater than zero, so it again goes back and calls this first one. So that is left side. So left side means the first two. That is A and B are interchange. Uh, the beginning and end. Okay, C and A again are interchanged in this case, and uh, again you have uh, the n equal to 1, then once again when it calls, no more uh, calling sequences because it becomes 0. Now you can uh, print beginning to end, that is B to A. Again, come back, come back to at that time, whatever the print statement, beginning to end, that is B to C, that is also done. Again, call the first one, so it becomes 1. So the first two are interchanged. Now you can see here, first two are interchanged and uh, uh, again call, so it becomes zero. Now A to C because beginning to end is printed. So you can see here, this is one, two, three. This is four. This is five. This is six. This is seven. So that's what written here, A to C, A to B, C to B then A to C, then B to A, B to C, then A to C. That's exactly what you have seen here. You know, this one, B, C, A, C, B, C. So it tallies with the all sequence of movements uh, starting from A to C movement up to the last, you know, up to the last movement, seventh uh, movement here. So, uh, if we, if we can uh, go through this with this algorithm, you can easily see that whenever you go from the top, that is root to the left hand side, this is for the first one. But when you come to this, this is right, right side. Okay, right side is corresponding to this, but again it would call the left hand side. So that's very important. For example, uh, left hand side means the last two parameters have to be interchanged. So this changing of beginning, auxiliary and end will keep the labeling will keep changing in order to make sure that you use the intermittent peg in order to move the disk. OK, so these are the. Moments which we have. Uh, for n equal to three. Now the same thing when n equal to 4 or 5, the tree looks bigger and it's not so easy to, you know, uh, follow through all the steps here. But n equal to 3 is reasonably, uh, you know, a smaller number, not small, too small, not too big, but uh, sufficient to understand the working of this uh, Tavas of Phenoid. Okay, so this tree is uh, corresponding to n equal to 3, explaining all the moments. OK, so we have here. The next example, of course, is Ackerman function. So that I think we will just pick it up in the next session. Thanks for watching and do join for my next lecture. Thank you.